Um, so uh, first I'll introduce the Headland Center for the Arts and then our readers. Um, if you don't already know the Headlands, I really encourage you to go to their website. Um, they are an incredible organization that I was so happy to be an affiliate at for a few years and now to occasionally do these readings. Um, they are a multi multidisciplinary international arts center dedicated to supporting artists, um, the creative process, and the development of new and innovative ideas and artworks. And when things are normal and they're in their full swing, they have two open houses, three open houses a year, excuse me, where you can visit, see the artist studios, hear writers read, um, enjoy the extraordinary location where the Headlands Center for the Arts is in the Marin Headlands. <laughs> um, if you are a writer and you are local, please consider looking at the Affiliate Artist Program. Um, if you are a writer and or artist and not local, please look into the Artist in Residence Program. Um, both are wonderful and I can't say enough nice things about the Headlands. Um, we, one of the reasons we're having this reading online, obviously, well, that's completely obvious why we're having it online, but um, we'd always intended to celebrate the Spring Artists in Residence, of which um, Laura Mullen was one of four writers coming to the Headlands. And um, with everything that's going on, we've placed this virtually, and we're so happy that Ploy Pirapokin, who was one of our affiliate artists, could join for this reading. So first I'm gonna introduce Laura, and then um, she'll read for a bit, and then um, we'll have Ploy read. Uh, so I wrote a little thing. I'm big, like, I just read the thing I wrote. I'm not an improviser. <laughs> so, um, I first came across Laura Mullen's work in the fantastic anthology of conceptual poetry, I'll Drown My Book, which introduced me to and contextualized for me many fantastic poets. She is a writer of extreme intellect and vision, as well as humor and playfulness. She is also an ideal writer to be part of the Headland Center for the Arts because her work is so closely tied to conceptual art and she has her own performance of, uh, her own practice of performance art. Um, I watched one online today, actually. Um, there have been so many disappointments in the past two months that we've had to just get over as part of our collective project of staying safe. But for me, one of them was not getting to meet Laura Mullen having this reading in person. Um, so I'm so pleased she agreed to take part in our first virtual reading, um, late night, Louisiana, <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> so with that, welcome, Laura. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Ploy, for joining me. So happy to be here. Um, <laughs> well, so happy to be here, <laughs> wherever, wherever it is I am. Um, I was so ecstatic about getting to come to the Headlands in spring. And um, when the notice of the postponement came, I took it really hard. <laughs> um, yeah, for so many reasons. And um, I did what any uh, red-blooded Californian might do in that situation, which is to get in the car and drive although it was like March 16th. I drove down to Florida, got in the ocean and drove back. It took about three days, maybe four, three, four, during which I wrote this poem. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's an on the road poem. Um, it was my way of thinking into this space. I was interested in seeing whether I could ride the energy of trying to understand and it's called Virus. And um, the thing that was helpful for me is that Susan Lewis of Posit Journal had asked me for a poem and I was like, oh man, I need a poem for Susan. I need a poem for Susan. So um, this is coming out in Posit. It's called Virus. One. Nobody has it, then everybody has it. It's nothing, not nothing, but distant. It looks like a little hat with tassels. It looks like a flower out of which other flowers emerge, out of which yet further bloom spiky. It's theirs, not ours, then it's ours. It looks like an exploding planet. Nobody has it, then everybody says, I'm wearing gloves, I'm using bleach, don't touch anything. Wipe off anything you touch, wipe off everything before you touch it. Don't get too close, don't breathe. Nobody has it, then everybody has it, or is going to have it, or already has, sharing the air, infected, caught. Two. 
These are the symptoms, wash your hands. This is how you wash your hands. There are no tests, anyone could have it, all of us. The bars are full of laughing people, symptomless. We are learning how to wash our hands. There are going to be tests, there are no tests. There are tests, but no one can get tested. There are no tests, the tests don't work. There are tests that work, but they're German. They're from a rogue lab in Washington, which was shut down by the government. They're expensive, we're making our own. We don't want the ones that work. These are the symptoms, dry cough, fever, empty shell shortness of breath, disbelief. These are the new phrases, social distancing, self-isolation. Suddenly no one is lonely or everyone is lonely. There's no fear of missing out. These are the symptoms, emails saying, these are the symptoms, emails from everyone saying, this is how you know you have it. This is how you know you don't have something else. This is what you should do. This is what you should not do. Everyone in the bars and cafes was talking about how you shouldn't go out. This is the curve. This is the curve we're trying to flatten. Stay home now. Stay home. Are you staying home? These are the symptoms, emails whose subject titles are postponed or canceled. Some of the symptoms include refunds and slight social adjustments toward mercy, moving in the direction of justice, belated and transient democracy, a drift toward the recognition that people around us might be people, might be human, as we might be human, connected, despite. Three. First it was in China and then it was in Italy, a lot. And after that it was in country after country, Germany for instance, but wasn't that in part because they were testing there? Once we started testing, it was here or it was here <clears throat> the whole time, in fact, but invisible everyone. Once you started, only started testing, everyone seemed to have it and those who could get to stay home could maybe flatten, as we said, the curve controlling the spread of the virus and those who could stayed home stayed home, washing down their Amazon orders with bleach. For the number of people who will die is a number that keeps going up another symptom, the stock market crashing so hard, so fast, they have to keep stopping the trading so the sick economy doesn't completely collapse. Oh, S&P 500, we love you, get up. Five. These are the symptoms. It's 1918. It's 2008. Can you flatten the curve? These are the symptoms. Joke videos and the word hoax, the word politics. A former disco queen reprising her famous anthem to a single basic expectation. Pee into the individual deep fluff of soap bubbles singing. At first I was afraid. Goes viral. Everyone's taking their temperature and flights to Paris are really cheap. Another symptom, Paris is closed, writes a friend on their way home. San Francisco is a ghost town, so it begins as a cough, as a sore throat. It's just like the flu, people die from the flu, the president insists, it's nothing. First the schools are closed and then it's keep the library open. No, close the libraries down. Traffic court will seize operations for now. This is a symptom. All water shutoffs are being reversed. And if we could do that now, why not? Six. The symptoms included wet markets and wildlife farming. The disease looked like a flower or exploding star. There was no way to tell who was really ill. No one who didn't have all of the symptoms should try to get tested. There aren't enough tests. Scarcity, one of the symptoms among the many symptoms. Everyone was eager to share information. Healthcare would be helpful, sure. Actually, no one seemed sure. There was a lot of worry about how this would impact us mentally as well as financially. And some countries just do better under authoritarian regimes. Worrying about school lunches or mental health was one of the symptoms. Some people panicking, order, hoarding, angry, and frightened, watching cartoons with the children sent home. I will survive was a hit again. Shit's getting real was a hit. Someone started a reading group to read Dante. Another friend worried that she should be using this time to read Proust. Seven. The symptoms included poor people asking for debt relief and health care, and the very rich congratulating themselves on their abundance of caution. 
using the ability to have everything they wanted delivered as if they had been for decades practicing for this siege, food, hand sanitizer, and toilet paper. Evidently, we were shitting ourselves in fright. Delivered to their houses, talks over the locked gates. The symptoms were deforestation, rising temperatures. Also, briefly, the suspicion that this was an escape bioweapon or else a political hoax. We were surviving in the tip jar, careening from postponement to cancellation. The words business as usual sounded magic. We were giving up our hopes and suddenly we saw the people who were serving us as people. Now they were a threat. Now we understood our good health depended on their good health. The symptoms included the infinite list of do's and don'ts. The situation was fluid, was unstable, was evolving in flux. If you must speak, speak into the crook of your bent arm, pulling your sleeve down over your hand before you reach out for a long moment, already long and lengthening moment. We were reminded that we were human, frail, mortal, vulnerable, all of us alike, and we were all pretty spooked. You should have seen the faces we kept touching. We were trying so hard not to touch. The symptoms included ageism, racism, class bias, sexism, and xenophobia, or else the pandemic was just another excuse. Eight, the phrase symptomless carrier was a symptom, as was the way we edged away from each other, keeping the depth of a dug grave between us. The word bungled in the phrase, we bungled the response, was a symptom, as was the insistence that we were going to look like Italy soon enough, except for the singing. Meanwhile, everyone knew everything had to close and no one wanted to close anything because we had no idea where to go or how to be as staying at home slowly turned from a sign you were a loser to a sign that you were thinking about the community. Nine, Florida. But we didn't believe it was happening because it was happening somewhere else to people we thought of as business rivals and other, and really we were all fine at that point, so why care? We were safe, it was only killing really old people, and it was at that moment I thought only must be the worst word in the English language, only and just, but maybe the worst word was actually anyway, as in anyway, we were all still fine at that point. We didn't know anyone who knew anyone who was dying, not at that point. We'd been turned to Fox News, unwilling to politicize the pandemic because it was spring break and those vacations vacations were booked and every Chinese restaurant on US 98 was shuttered in its empty parking lot and the college students in the tiny crowded hotel elevator said come on there's plenty of room it was all very masked the red death or what IDK maybe white noise I said no I'll wait watching the fog of denial begin to anyway I ordered a latte with virus in it, reading another email. Someone carefully isolated wanted me to know asymptomatic carriers are the most dangerous. 10, and the ocean, someone crying. I imagined thousands of latex gloves reaching out, translucent, tangled fingers full of salt water, blindly seeking a lost note or instrument all the hand condoms. And then ocean, I meant to write, not yet harmed, but that was a lie. Try also sick of us, undulating blue and white nitrile caught in the surf because to touch the world was to touch our own fragility and transience. 11. Because the implications remain active on stainless steel for 72 hours. Because after sneezing, economic collapse stays viable in the air days after being released. Because withholding information remains dangerous. Because the president keeps trying to tell us in droplets what to call it, meaning don't touch your face. Because we failed to ask the right questions soon enough. Because we didn't ask anyone in Wuhan how they felt. Describe your symptoms, translate, preferring the dull, flat language of the CDC, fever, shortness of breath, dry cough. Because by the time we were willing to listen to what it felt like, knives in your joints, it was too late. Because our 
failure of empathy was smeared on the surface of every object brought into the house we were washing with bleach. Bleach was suddenly a precious substance. Don't, we had to be told, drink it, because we had to ask everyone to please step back, because the target of the cleaning solution is the spike protein, because, but here the automatic cutoff kicked in again and trading was halted for 15 minutes, after which continued chaos and tumbling loss upon loss. 12, every time I had a thought, I thought, just don't tell anyone, a symptom. Bars and cafes full of happy people, young people on the beach laughing, how do you like your quarantine? Asking yourself what you'd die for, this, not that, and so forth, that, not this, is a symptom. But ignorance, I thought, isn't bleach. 13, the graphic. Am I that red dot meeting a blue dot, making the blue dot red to go away to meet another blue dot, turning it red? Or am I a blue dot dodging a red dot to hit another blue dot without any visible difference? Which blue dot am I then hitting a red dot and turning red? Which red dot am I as all the dots eventually turn red? If this were more like reality, someone says, some red dots would be disappearing. Am I ready to disappear now? Now, whatever ricocheting color I am in this silence, am I am ready to disappear if it would bring forth sooner the world I believed might be on the other side of this, in which we all say in every language, I am a dot and you are a dot and there is no difference between us. 14. No one had it or everyone had it. No one had it and everyone had it. In the time of the non-test, the failure of testing, no one was ill, everyone was ill. We were all fine and dying. It was business as spring, only the shelves stripped. Meanwhile, we wanted to go on with our normal lives, as usual, holding our own hands under the running water, working the soap up into a froth, like the froth on the mouth of a rabid dog, singing happy birthday, or no, not I, taking the time, if frightened and educated, to disinfect each surface. Now the harsh, clear, stinging perfume of Clorox will, if we survive, always bring this moment back. 15. Anyway, sunlight, I wrote in this notebook using the virus. It looked like a funny hat, like a crown is a funny hat, like a flower is also an exploding star or seed or sea urchin, a lipid coated structure in which each person who died was me, us. I wrote this down on the way back home in the invisible ink of the virus that made us begin to see those we hadn't wanted to acknowledge each person who was careful a note to say thank you for the care you take of me let me take care of you a flower on which other flowers are blooming a flower made of other smaller flowers what it looked like Magnified what it meant to be a planet visible at last. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the disadvantages of this is like no reaction from everyone who is listening so intently to that wonderful poem. So my applause is everyone's. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so remarkable. I have so many notes. I can't wait for our Q&A. Um, really incredible. I love just also that kind of like digesting the moment, you know, that we're in and getting to hear what you have to offer, which is just great. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, Emily. I'm going to mute myself to... Okay. Um, next up, we have uh, Ploy Pirapokin. Um, so I'm so excited that Ploy is with us tonight. Um, it's not only because I love hearing her work and um, getting to know Ploy when I was an affiliate was really one of the highlights of my time there. 
Um, but it also struck me as I was kind of preparing for this reading today of the um, connection between Ploy and Laura's approach. Um, and I feel like this might be, I don't know, I feel like there's something I'm attempting to say here that is larger and I feel like on a precipice and if what is underneath me is shaky, so apologies. But there's something about an approach to memory and to storytelling that I felt looking back over both of their writings a connection and part of that is in um i a sense of like play of this playfulness that i was mentioning but um i was reminded today in my reading of something that roland bart suggested that there's the only way to combat myth is with myth um and that the stories that uh we tell take control of the stories that we were told um and when I think of a, the work that I know of ploys can um, really bring in like the surreal that's mixed with the real and there's families trying to understand each other and the stakes are high and the um, scene is focused. And there's something about um, that, that kind of thing that in the Bart quotation of trying to like take the thing that you're trying to understand and using the exact mode to attempt to understand it that struck me um, as something that I feel might be happening in both writers works um, so with that <laughs> um, I can't wait to hear what Ploy is going to read tonight um, and I'll hand it over to her welcome Ploy hello thank you um, <laughs> um, thank you Laura for reading that breathless poem um, not breathless in the way that we have COVID symptoms but breathless like we were on this trip <laughs> um, it's so I just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone for joining especially my students whether it's from creative nonfiction UCLA or soda you know I have my boss here as well I can see um, college roommates you know this is just fantastic um, and and I would like, you know, to dedicate these two flash stories to my two high school friends who are here right now as well from Hong Kong um, and one in New York. Okay, uh, so the first short story I'm going to read is one that Evan actually nominated for the push cart a long time ago. Um, so here we go. David the Cephalopod. One, at the California Academy of Arts and Sciences, a sign of the octopus exhibition said, no flash photography allowed at the oct bleh, no flash photography allowed at the octopus tank. I wouldn't want to be on display for the world to see either. It would be too much like my high school in Hong Kong, where words spread like rain clouds in the sky and judgment came down in flashes of light. Octopuses can change colors to blend into the background, I read in the little information box on the side. I thought of how cool it must be to blend into the background at whim the cells in my body expanding to camouflage me, my cells responding quicker than my heart would. At 27, I had slept with a hundred men and I can sleep with a hundred more. I guess my body did respond quicker than my heart. Two, the octopus is an amazing creature with three hearts, two branchial ones that pump blood through each of its two gills, while the third is a systemic one that pushes blood through the body. When I was 13, my French teacher David asked me if I would have coffee with him after school. We met on a humid September afternoon at Mido Cafe, where the shutters were always down and sunlight shone through in stripes. I liked the way his pale hand looked against mine, the way his yellow beard looked coarse but was soft to touch, the way our eyes were open when we kissed. Octopuses don't have eyelids, so they have no choice but to kiss staring at one another's pupils. Three. Two thirds of an octopus's neurons reside in its arms, not its head. As a result, the arms can problem solve how to open a shellfish while their owners are busy doing something else. The arms can even react after they've been completely severed. When David asked me to buy Trojans from 7-Eleven, I tried to tell him my body wanted something my neurons could not get together fast enough to object. He asked me if I had been with any other man before and I said, sure. I wasn't sure of being finger banged by another 13 year old Jack Whitson who had announced to his entire rugby team that I was his girlfriend counted. But I was sure that if I had been with any other man, he wouldn't have mattered then. Four, the octopus is a social cephalopod. When isolated from their own kind, they will sometimes shoal with fish. At school, David spent lunch times in the staff room. I spent lunch times watching Jack play rugby on the field. 
Davy would ask me in the evenings if I wanted to go to the movies for once, instead of hiding in his cave of a studio in Chunking Mansion. What would Jack say if he saw us, I asked. What could that boy say, David said. No one would suspect an older Guaylo with a young Chinese wife, I said. Octopuses love roaming around the seabed, collecting discarded shell halves and carrying them back to their corner. Whenever they got scared or threatened, they would enclose themselves inside these shells. The truth made us retreat. Five, after a long day of foraging for food, octopuses can follow their own mucus trail back home, but they generally use visual landmarks to navigate around their environments. By November, I had learned how to make David smile. Learning how to make David smile meant I knew how to make men smile. I had complete control when I put the tip of my tongue gently in his opening when I slapped his chest while sitting on top of him and when he laid across my bare chest to fall asleep. Then I would slip my panties back on, my bra, my white collared shirt, my beige skirt, and my leather shoes and walk home undistinguished in my uniform. At dinner with my parents, I stopped serving my father first. I claimed the first helping of sea bass, the white meat and juice running down the sides, breaking the skin with my spoon. Six. Humans, like octopuses, have entirely soft bodies. The only difference between an octopus and a human being is that an octopus, but I would like to argue that even a human's mouth could turn into a beak when angry and break things with his teeth. Jack asked me why I didn't hurt when he entered. I told him he wasn't the first. You slut, he snapped, such a slut. He drew blood. He broke things in his room that night, like staplers, his computer screen, his shelves, his heart. Seven. At school, five girls in the bathroom cornered me to ask how sex felt. I told them that sex with someone you love felt soothing, like swimming in the Pacific Ocean, but then they laughed. Their shrill laughter severed my nerves. Octopuses don't have any internal temperature regulation, so if you freeze them, you can get them to the point where they fall unconscious. When the principal asked me what had happened since September, in the cafe, in the movie theaters, at his house, my veins turned into ice. He asked me many things like, did he make you do it? Were you scared? Did he make you? I heard them all laughing at the girl who couldn't keep her legs closed, their laughter hacking my limbs. Eight, after mating, it's game over for octopuses. Males wander off to die. The female's body undertakes a cascade of cellular suicide, rippling from her optic glands through her tissues and organs. It was 4 p.m. on a cold December Tuesday, and everyone knew why David had been fired. Come with me, he said at the school gate. We can go somewhere, anywhere. He put both hands on my shoulders, his tentacles wrapped around me, blowing soft, wet kisses on my arms. I wanted the circular suckers to take me and leave a comatose body behind. Maybe the suckers, too slippery, wouldn't hold, and I would have to shove the entire arm down my throat. I felt sorry saying no. I was sorry that he got fired. I watched him walk away, my two branchial hearts pump blood through heaving breaths, while the third one pushed sorries through my body. Okay. <laughs> and the next splash piece is... Um, called Filter Feeding. I wrote it at Headlands as well. <laughs> Thanks, Connie. Okay. Hours before the British surrendered, Japanese soldiers entered the school being used as a hospital at the front lines. They bayoneted wounded soldiers incapable of hiding, gang raped the nurses, and mutilated every single person inside. Carcasses were left out like empty shells on the field. The Japanese slept in fortresses built in Kowloon in between villages like ours surrounding the border. They spared no one in their march through China. Is that why you came back? From the jetty, I spotted your gray silhouette above the shallow tide. The sun had set. Black-faced spoonbills had flown off. Wind blew ripples into the water, peppering what was clear with little black dents that lined the smooth blue surface. Cool air reminded me of the first time we met. The crickets stopped hissing, and the crabs and the mollusks had retreated back into their shells. You dove and fed from the seabed, hidden in the dark of the mangrove forests. Do you remember that time you got caught in our nets? 
Our men tried hacking the ropes with dull knives and our women splashed water on all of you to stop the bleeding. I was a boy then, too weak to throw you off our boat, too scared to try. The low tide that year hurt us too. The oysters weren't plump enough to sell, their flesh a third of the size of what they once were. Remember when my father cried out, there's a boy in there, one of the dugongs has eaten a boy. Our men crowded around to see your pale face. I can recall those eyes even when I dream. Forlorn, deep set murky eyes like typhoon clouds so pregnant with water, even sunlight could not penetrate through. We thought you were dead, but then you opened your mouth and whistled a sound so shrill, we dropped everything to cover our ears. Your shell leapt back into the water, dragging nets and knives, but not the rest of your herd. We buried them in the sand. Since then, our harvests started later and later every year. Some of us blame the metal, some blame the polluted water swept in from China, some of us blamed you. Larvae eventually settled on wooden posts planted across the tidal flat. We waited for our oysters to blossom, but raked only barnacles. I thought, if dugongs held little lives inside, why couldn't oysters hold on to their world? I heard drunken Japanese nearby and knew they were coming. If they didn't come now, they'd come tomorrow. I couldn't imagine living beyond them, just like I couldn't imagine our oysters dying or your body in a dugong. My brother had gone to bed right before my parents made love in their room. I left our front door open, Wading waist deep into the tide, I brought my face down to hear you underwater holding my breath. At what point will we forgive ourselves for leaving? At what point do we join barnacles on their posts or hide in giant dugongs lost at sea? Thank you. Thank you, Ploy. Same thing. I know that silence is not the response you would be receiving if you were in person, but um. That was wonderful, thank you. <laughs> you can see the love people are giving you. <laughs> yeah, amazing. That was so great. Um, well, now we would love to um, open up questions to everyone who's um, joined. And um, we have, uh, Evan's already asked people to use the chat feature to be able to ask questions. Anything that comes up there will be relayed to the writers. Um, and I, I'll jump in and I'll get the ball started. Um, ball rolling, <laughs> party started. <laughs> I am always mixing up idioms. Um, so I think that the first thing you know, I have some kind of like more like heady questions about practice and um, projects and stuff. But I feel like my first question is to both writers, how are you doing with um, being stuck at home? And, you know, Ploy, you normally would have access to your studio at the Headlands. Laura, your travel was uh, changed into an incredible road trip, clearly. But, um, but also, you know, so I guess just getting some idea of what your life looks like right now, what, where you're writing, um, how much you're writing, uh, would be great. I think we'd all appreciate just a little bit of insight. You want to start, Ploy? Uh, I'll, I'll wait for you. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so um, the road trip, just so we're clear, was like March, it was March 16th to March 19th, 20th. Um, I was in Florida just at the moment to watch it pivot. Like it went in a day from nothing is happening to something is happening. Um, uh, and then I came back. Um, and I came back to New Orleans. And it quickly became apparent that New Orleans was going to be one of the major epicenters. Um, and um, uh, being here has been really, really, really important and incredibly terrifying and um, also deeply, deeply horrifying, grief striking, um, watching the impact of uh, lack of social justice on the track of the disease. So um, I'm in my house, uh, I'm writing every day. Um, I meant to sort of say when I was talking about the poem itself to 
just mention, it's been a kind of pressure that's been really important to me to put onto my students because of where they, because so much happens down here that isn't um, made uh, visible. It's a, it's a place where oil is extracted and places where oil are extracted are very dirty places and silenced places. Um, so that people write in these situations and so I'm writing in this situation. Um, yeah, that's a start. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I, um, I feel funnily enough that I finally have time to do all of my work, <laughs> which is reading and grading and, and writing. Um, I didn't wish for a pandemic, but it was definitely a restart or, or you know, to sort of rejuvenate and relook at what's important and what I prioritize for the kind of artist life I want. Um, of course, I'm bummed about Headlands, and I know Sean is here and Heidi is here, and it's no one's fault. Um, and what I'm struck by that allows me to continue writing is the kindness of communities, our artist communities, you know, whether it's teaching or one another. Um, you know, I, as, as someone who went through SARS in Hong Kong, and there seems to be a very clinical way of dealing with things to make it work. And I know that that had happened here. Um, and, but I am reminded again, you know, why I chose to live in America. And it's because people can be very caring and giving and empathetic and willing to listen to how your day is and very respectful of space and, and uh, individual sort of goals. So I think that's where I'm finding a lot of joy, you know, things like this and being able to still talk about writing and, and art as well. Thank you, that's wonderful. Um, I have a comment here from Claire. Um, she says, first of all, uh, you are both marvelous, thank you. Question for both of you. What are you reading during these days and what are you listening to? You can choose who goes first. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll go first since. <laughs> um, what am I reading? Uh, I'm reading a lot of Zen Buddhist meditative texts. Um, I, I think one of my students at Creative Nonfiction is writing how to be creative during this time. And it just like led me down this path of reading Zen Buddhist texts about being present and being mindful. So Hain and Sudan is one that I've read. Um, what am I listening in terms of music? Um, obviously, I always listen to BTS, um, which is a K-pop band. <laughs> um, but I, I sort of outside of my brand um, by listening to Doja Cat. You know, Drake has a new album that, you know, sort of like pumping club music to, you know, pretend that I'm still in a club just without people. Great. I'll hit the the music part first. Um, I'm listening always to um, experimental uh, classical music, and this is a good moment for me to put in a plug. If you don't know about it, um, the International Contemporary Ensemble is doing a tuning meditation every Saturday that anyone can join in. It's a Pauline Oliveros piece, and it's a miraculous way to spend a Saturday afternoon. You can find it on Facebook or I can hook you up with the link, but it's extraordinary. And um, yeah, uh, Claire Chase is one of the people putting that together, um, a kind of guiding star for me when I think about music. Although um, I want to confess that in my head right now is a, is a piece of music that I've got on the iPod for long walks. And it's a rapper from Baton Rouge called Nussie. And the piece is the dumb way. We're gonna do this the dumb way, but you're not stupid, you're not stupid, you're not stupid. We're gonna do this the dumb way. Just seems like a theme song for this moment. Um, reading the collection of, of essays about improvisation called Playing for Keeps that I've been reading. Um, Tom Dent's collection, the collection of Tom Dent's work that just came out from UNO Press called um, Tom Dent, New Orleans Griot. 
uh, really super great. Genevieve Kaplan's Aviary, um, I just picked up and have been really loving Emily Dickinson. Um, but I also think it's a, a good moment for me to confess that under moments of stress like this, I really have to turn to things that will chill me out enough to relax. And so um, I'm reading Persuasion right now by Jane Austen for about the 90th time. As I need to be looking at a page where I know almost exactly what word is going to come next. Yeah, I hear you. I love both those responses. The idea of being in the club, I have like somehow just radio late in life. <laughs> um, but also just knowing it's, exci it's exciting to explore, but it's exciting to just know where you are. More comments. Um, Ellen writes, uh, this is my first time here. Do either of you teach online right now? Ploy, you're nodding. You want to take that up first? Yes, I'm teaching uh, three classes online, two sections of creative nonfiction at the Creative Nonfiction Foundation, and then UCLA Extension, I'm teaching a dialogue and point of view course. I've always taught online. Um, and right now, um, I also am of the School of the Arts in San Francisco, which is a public arts high school. Um, Emily has taught there as an artist in residence, um, and so has John Hickey, who's also on the call. Um, and we have some SOTA students here. Um, you don't need to sis. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've, we've transitioned online, and I think it's, a, it's been quite rewarding in a human seed into people's houses and everyone's hair growing longer. So yeah, we're, we're doing it online. Um, I have taught online for Stetson University. Um, I'm not doing so right now. I am going to offer a free workshop through Dogfish here in New Orleans. Awesome. There are, are um, I mean, I know it's already been talked about how like this, uh, explosion of potentially a huge sea change for, for access for so many learners. But um, it's also a nice salve in these early days of this new reality to be able to access workshops, information, um, community. Okay, um, I have more comments. Oh, this one is from Jill. Uh, for ploy or for both? How do you incorporate research into your writing? Which comes first, the octopus or the characters? <laughs> the octopus. No, I, I, I'm always drawn to research because I think there's so many, I'm, I'm sure Laura can agree, there's so many wild things happening in our world. Um, but I think what we don't find when we find you know, really fun facts or something interesting is imagining that experience of being in there, of discovering. So at least for that piece, I had the narrative and then I was trying to think, how can I, how can I structurally represent it? Um, and so, so when I thought, oh, octopuses have eight limbs, you know, I can number it eight ways. So beautiful, that was so beautiful, the, the back and forth there between both your stories, the wonderful back and forth, so beautiful for Earth Day between the natural and the human. Love that seamless transition. Um, for me, research is prayer. It's really um, a way of being in the world that honors the world. Just trying to know, trying to understand is tr trying to love. Oh, what a wonderful way to put it. That's really gives so much energy to, for me, there's a lot of um, concentration that comes with research, but maybe that concentration is also something that's akin to sustaining love and to being in, that, in a relationship with maybe your own mind. Um, Michelle Bowen writes, uh, the virus with the imagery of a flower, the speaker as an octopus, and she asks, what is the significance of the an Earth Day question? <laughs> Can I just laugh for a minute about Earth Day? It's a kind of bitter, wry laugh. There's two prongs to it. One is um, 
Earth Day is 50 years old, and in those 50 years, we've hurt the planet worse than we ever hurt the planet. Yeah. Um, and I, I like to joke when I think about it, I like to think, you know, try this on your dentist. Try saying, hey, I'm going to have a tooth day. <laughs> One day a year, I'll think about my teeth. Just see how your dentist <laughs> feels about that. <laughs> um, the natural world is everything. Um, everything. Absolutely everything. In part because uh, the, the person reaching out to you right now with this thing we call the English language is a mind inside a brain, inside a body. And the body is the natural world. Hmm. Yeah, for me, uh, I felt I didn't really pay attention to a lot of greenery because I grew up in cities. And so I was always so enamored by, you know, poets and, and writers who would talk about perceive the natural world to be vegetation and landscape and and how I lacked that and what that kind of lacking meant. Um, and there's a story I translated by a Chinese writer, Hong Kong Chinese writer called uh, by Hui Lan Chu, and she writes about the way we think is determined by the architecture of what we grew up in, and that Hong Kong people are orderly and follow rules and very easy to control in that way because we live in such tiny places. And I just it just sort of made me realize like what I was lacking was this idea of what it would be to be expansive and connected. And that's just something I, mm. I thought about a lot when I was trying to incorporate something I wasn't aware of a lot, which is the natural world in my work. And there we go. Um, that's wonderful. And I have my own question that I just want to pose to you. And um, uh, to the audience, if you have any more questions, please put them into the chat. Um, but it strikes me that, you know, both of you, both of the things you read tonight, but also both of your work does, you know, respond to the world around us. And um, uh, I guess, I have a real like chicken in the egg question about um, like responding to current events, responding to what happens around us to history. Like it, this is a little bit related to the, you know, does the octopus come first um, story? But you know, I feel like it's a real uh, conundrum as a writer to jump in there. And like in your piece, um, Laura, where you really are, you know, we're like, kind of following you in that poem while you're like digesting the information almost like in time you know like you then when you arrive in Florida um I guess I wondered if both of you would maybe speak about the how you come to write about um either current events or historical I'm thinking of the um second piece you read ploy but um I guess what your how your journey what your journey is like to get to that place where you are uh incorporating things that are maybe like outside of a uh that are either outside of a personal experience or are incorporating something that other people are also in the middle of experiencing and that have implications of larger than just yourself I'm keep on muting and unmuting myself i don't know flora if you want to go first or ploy <laughs> Ploy got muted somehow. Oh. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> um, Ploy, do you want to start in part because I'd love to hear you talk about the historical as well as the contemporary. I've always found for me when I wanted to write, it was because I had read books and didn't feel like I was represented. And so in many ways, you know, I didn't know those terms back then, you know, representation or see myself but I just thought I can say something about this too so it was a reaction so my writing was in a way always reactionary or the, the impetus to start writing was reactionary and I think that's why I feel so connected with I guess current events um, and then later on I think when I'm building my collection or my collection of essays I start to think that it, we are trying to solve or what's important to us or the types of narratives that we want to be about us. And, and that's why we write as opposed to do other forms of art. 
you know, because hoarding um, and documenting. So that's how I feel I, I approach the impetus of writing. In terms of historical facts, um, there were always questions that I just had, uh, you know, in my life. And so like my high school is KG5, King George V, and we were always told that there were bodies buried under the field <laughs> and to not dig so much in case a bone pops out. Um, but, you know, I just wondered, well, what must have it been like, you know, when it was used as a hospital and that people were killed there. Um, so it's, I feel like I'm trying to answer my own questions about the past and my experiences through imagining in my work. I, I think um, I'm just gonna kind of slide back to the sense that it's so important to be able to speak about our experience, maybe um, off of the question that Floyd raised about representation, um, to have the ability to talk about what we're going through, when we're going through it, is so deeply essential. Um, and in this case, with virus, as with the the um, nonfiction piece called Torch Song, which is in Complicated Grief, which I think the booksmith has, it's another example of um, me trying to not only chart what's happening, but chart the way what we said what was happening has been replaced by the new version of what's happening, which is then replaced by another version of what we think is happening, which is then, and that's something we go through often, and um, it's very hard to stop it. It's very hard to slow it down. As the media points out, Trump is lying so much, we can't even like undo all the lies. There are just too many of them. So to just slide into the contemporary and begin to say, here was a version, here's another version. What happened in those two versions? What's the, and for me, writing is always a form of reading, a form of listening. So it's a lot of like um, trying to be the threshold and let the world come through. That's, um, it's getting very late here. So I might feel, oh. I might get a little mucky in my answers. <laughs> so I am so would I so would be asleep by now. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> um, we should do a dream journal for like everyone contributes. If anyone's having like totally crazy dreams, right? Everyone is having totally crazy dreams. <laughs> yeah, and that's, um, yeah, a beautiful. I just think that's fascinating, though, to be able to talk about what through while we're going through it. I mean, on like a personal level, I find that's so, dis I mean, I guess it's just all the reasons it might be difficult. And then also because of my like deep training as a human to like push stuff down and not talk about it, ex-Catholic. Um, so I love that call to arms, you know, to, to really just let it be and be in it, be present, you know. A um, undergrad of mine named Liz Haley, she just did an honors thesis this spring. And the long title poem is called Flood. And she lived in Denham Springs. And she wrote the first stanza of that poem, standing in her driveway knee deep in water. Wow. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. And by being in it. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we also have a comment from Vivian, um, a question for Ploy, Hong Kong representation. Do you feel like growing up in Hong Kong stifled or encouraged creativity? Um, absolutely can confirm we were looking for bodies when they dug up the field at school. <laughs> um, I mean, it's funny. I think the Hong Kong culture stifles creativity unless it could be commoditized. But then when I, when I say that out loud, it's, it's like, isn't that everywhere? Mm. Um, you know, I. I feel like for school or growing up, we were encouraged to do arts to never take it so seriously because it could never be a career. Um, I actually think that made perhaps, because Vivian is also an artist, um, and, and I feel like that probably made us a lot more fearless because we never could feel like we can take it seriously, whatever we did. And so it didn't matter as long as we liked it or we had a vision. In a strange way, I feel like once I learned about publishing and, and that I, I felt a little constrained, you know, like, you know, is it too much or, or who will read it, you know, that sort of thing. 
I, I kind of feel it might be for a lot of people here too, you know, when, when you're trying to do art, maybe in a family that doesn't respect it, or it's not a path that is lucrative, or you couldn't really feel like you could be yourself, whether it's your sexuality. I think in many ways, the stakes are the reason that you continue doing it. And I think that that anchors you in a way to keep doing it. So I don't know, it, 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 you know, stifled or encouraged, I think, are both sides of the same coin. Hmm. Um, and I've got a final comment here, a shout out from James Richard, Complicated Grief, such a great book. <laughs> uh, enduring Freedom, amazing. Um, yeah, just everyone, if you're, if you're not fully familiar with Laura's work, you're in for a treat. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I, I think, you know, it's um, eight o'clock here. It's later for you. Um, unless we've got more questions from the audience, I want to just say thank you so much to um, Laura and Ploy and to Evan for hosting. And um, this is going to be the first of a couple different Headlands readings that we're doing with other artists and residents uh, who should have been here in the spring and with our incredible list of affiliate artists um, that are currently affiliates. Um, we have amazing alumna. So um, please stick with us and stick with the booksmith. Get your books from the best bookstore in San Francisco. Yay. <laughs>